Hi, and welcome to Roswell United Methodist Church. My name is Michael Cromwell, and I have the joy of serving as one of the associate pastors here at RUMC. Thanks for joining us for our on-demand version of the sermon, which will be delivered later today. If you'd like to watch our services live, you can do so via our live stream at 9 o'clock and 11.15. Notice our different worship times and our different hours that we have now. You'll also be able to see the entire worship service service on demand later this afternoon at rumc.com slash sermons. We are so glad that you are with us today. We're thankful for your presence and we're thankful for your generosity and the different ways that you are helping to make RUMC a place of community and faith. Let's have a word of prayer before we hear our sermon. Gracious and loving God, we love you so much and we are grateful for this day and this day that we have to worship you. May the words that we are to hear, may they not only pierce our ears, but pierce our hearts as well, that we might be changed in different people because of what you have to say to us today. We thank you and we love you all in Christ's name we pray. Amen. Now let's hear our sermon from today. This morning I'll be reading from the book of Judges, chapter 5, verses 1 through 9. And this is what it says. Then Deborah and Barak, the son of Abinoam, sang on that day, saying, For the leaders leading in Israel, for the people volunteering, bless the Lord. Hear, you kings, listen, you dignitaries. I myself to the Lord. I myself will sing. I will sing praise to the Lord, the God of Israel. Lord, when you went out from Seir, when you marched from the field of Edom, the earth quaked, the heavens also dripped, the clouds also dripped water, the mountains flowed with water at the presence of the Lord. This Sinai at the presence of the Lord, the God of Israel, in the days of Shamgar, the son of Anath, in the days of Jael, the roads were deserted and travelers went by roundabout ways. The peasantry came to an end. They came to an end in Israel until I, Deborah arose, until I arose, a mother in Israel, New gods were chosen. Then war was in the gates. Not a shield or a spear was seen among 40,000 in Israel. My heart goes out to the com commanders of Israel, the volunteers among the people. Bless the Lord. Pray with me. Lord, may this day be a day where we give praise to you, where we give blessing to you, where we sing praise to you by all that we do and, Lord, by all that we say. It's in Christ's name we pray. Amen. It's Mother's Day, and the preacher's reading from the book of Judges. Well, <laughs> would it help any if you knew this was a song? Yeah, I just read a song this morning, and chances are pretty good that the band won't pl be playing this song or singing this song because it has words in it like, in the days of Shamgar, the son of Anath. I don't know that even country music could make a song out of that. This is a song that takes place 1150 years before Christ. And they're singing. They're singing. They're singing because for 20 years, Israel had been in a hard, hard, hard place. There was a thug in Israel named Sisera. And Sisera had 900 iron chariots. That was when an iron chariot was the... The, the pinnacle of technology. It was the equivalent of an F-22 fighter jet today. And Sisera had 900 iron chariots. Nobody could stand up to 900 iron chariots. No matter how many men you had, no matter how many soldiers, no matter how many spears, no matter how many shields, they couldn't stand up. So they didn't even try. 40,000 warriors in Israel, but no one even tried. As it says here, neither a, a shield nor a, a spear was seen in Israel because of those 900 iron chariots. It says the peasantry ceased in Israel. Even normal, everyday people, they didn't want to come together. Cicero might think that they were tr plotting some kind of revolution or something, and he'd pull out his iron chariots and roll right over them. So nobody even tried until a mother in Israel, Deborah, arose. 
You may have known that that name Deborah was a, a, a biblical name, but you didn't know where it came from. Well, this is where it came from. The book of Judges, chapter 5. Deborah, a mother in Israel, arose. Deborah. Deborah was a woman that had the Spirit of God on her. And she would sit under a palm tree, and people would come to her wanting to know what the will of God was. One of those people was a fellow named Barak. And Barak came to her, and, and Deborah called him commander, which is a strange thing because there hadn't been an army in 20 years, not a shield or a spear was seen in all of Israel. But Deborah had a word from God, and she told Barak, said, God wants you to go to Mount Tabor and recruit 10,000 men among the, from the tribes of Nephthali and Zebulon. Well, if 40,000 couldn't stand up to 900 iron chariots, what in the world would 10,000 do? They'd do even less. She told Barak that God wanted him to, to go and, and recruit those 10,000 troops. And Barak said, no, I won't go unless you go with me. Now, what kind of commander says, I won't go to battle unless somebody's mama comes with me? I, I, it doesn't elicit a lot of confidence there from the people that he's going to recruit, but he goes, and she goes with him. And they go to Mount Tabor, and they begin to, to recruit 10,000 troops among the men of Nephthali and Zebulon, and Sisera heard about it. Sisera pulled his 900 iron chariots out of their garages and began to roll toward Mount Tabor. And that's when it says in verse 4, the earth quaked, the heavens dripped, the clouds also dripped water, the mountains flowed with water at the presence of the Lord. In other, in other words, God stepped in and it began to rain. When the clouds dripped, that's just fancy talk, it began to rain. Well, iron chariots don't do so well in the rain. And it's not the iron... It's the weight of the chariot. They get bogged down in the mud. And the waters came from Mount Tabor, and the, the 900 iron chariots got stuck in the mud. Well, then they were easy pickings for the, the 10,000 troops that came off of Mount Tabor. And they just wiped away all of them except for one. And that was the one they wanted most. That was Sisera. And Sisera jumped out of the back of his chariot and began to run. And after he ran, he ran some more. And after he ran more, he, he ran still more after that until he came to a tent. And it was a tent that belonged to a woman named Jael. He ran in the tent and he, he hid under her rug. He said, if anybody comes looking for me, tell them I'm not here. Well, after a little while, he said, can I have something, some water to drink? She said, well, I'll do one better than that. I'll give you milk. So she gave him milk to drink. Now, if you're tired and you drink milk, what happens? You fall asleep. And that's what happened. He fell asleep hiding under her rug in her tent. And that's when she pulled out a tent peg and she nailed his head to the floor. This is not a bedtime story to read to your children. She nailed his head to the floor. And then Barak comes and, and he says, hey, have you seen Sisera? She said, if he looks anything like the guy that's nailed to my floor, there's your man. Well, they began to celebrate. There was a big, they, Barak and Deborah begin to sing. And this is the song that they began to sing. They began to sing in praise to God and, and in praise to Deborah. That Deborah was an ordinary mother in Israel who relied on God. And God does his most extraordinary work through ordinary people who rely on him. And that's what I want to talk about first this morning. God does his most extraordinary work through ordinary people. Ordinary mothers, ordinary dads, ordinary sons and daughters who rely on him. Deborah was not the commander, that was Barak. Deborah was not the executioner, that was Jael. Deborah did not make it rain that was God. Deborah did what God called her to do and left it up to God for the results. She didn't try and be perfect. 
She wasn't caught up into doing what other people were supposed to be doing. She did what God had called her to do. And in the Bible, perfect is, is way overrated. It's way overrated. D.W. Winnicott tells, he was a psychiatrist and, and a pediatrician. He was trying to do, do a study about parenting. He drew together, a, was trying to draw together a sample group of parents who, that after interviewing them and filling out questionnaires, that, that these parents, that their parenting skills were what he considered perfect or, or near perfect anyway. And after he developed this sample group of parents, he went to the children. And what he found surprised him. Surprised him a lot that the children of, of, of perfect or near perfect parents, they didn't cope so well. That when adversity and injustice came to them, they didn't know how to, how to move on. And they got caught up, they got bogged down in the injustice and in the adversity. So he changed the trajectory of his study. He decided to go to, to children, children that were solid, productive, and well-rounded. And when he, he did the sampling and, and the interviews and the questioning, he then went to the parents of those children to find out their parenting skills. And what he discovered was that, well, they were parents that were sometimes too lenient and sometimes they were too strict. Sometimes they said the wrong things and sometimes they did the wrong things. The difference was, was when they said or did the wrong thing, they apologized and they moved on. And what happened was that they produced children. That when adversity, when injustice came, they learned how to, to deal with it and move on and move on. That perfect, perfect is, is way overrated. As a matter of fact, we come here every Sunday to practice. Certainly to practice praise. Certainly to practice coming together and, and, and joining our spirits with God's spirit here where, where, where two or more are gathered. But to do one more thing, to practice asking for forgiveness. Because all of us, everyday ordinary people, have, have done some things and said some things during the week that we ought not to have done and we ought not to have said. And we've left unsaid some things that we certainly should have said. And it's here that in the Lord's Prayer that we practice, forgive us our trespasses. Every Sunday, we say the Lord's Prayer, forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. We're not talking about walking on somebody else's property. What we're talking about is that we've said and done some things we ought not to have said and done. And we ask for Jesus to forgive us. Well, it's why He gave His life on the cross. Not just as a symbol of forgiveness, but that He would he gathered all the things that would destroy us. He gathered the sin. He gathered the, the fear. He gathered the shame and the guilt. And he nailed it to the cross to take away its power. To give us the power of forgiveness. And on the cross, when he forgave us, that word forgiveness in the New Testament, it means to separate, to separate us from those things that would destroy us. And so when we, we, we practice forgiveness here, when we ask him for forgiveness, he separates us from those things that would destroy us, the sin and the shame and the guilt. He separates us from it, and we leave it here and move on. And we rely we rely on him that what he did on the cross, that it was enough. It was enough for your forgiveness and mine. Ordinary people, ordinary people. That God does his most extraordinary work through ordinary people. Ordinary moms, dads, sons and daughters. Ordinary people who rely on him.
But not only that, that God does his most extraordinary work through ordinary people who give affirmation. That's what Deborah did. She gave affirmation to Barak. She called him commander. Now, he hadn't commanded anything in 20 years. Not a shield nor a spear was seen in 20 years. Among 40,000 troops in Israel, certainly not among their commanders. She calls him commander. Well, he's not willing to go to battle unless somebody's mama goes with him. But she calls him commander anyway. That what she gives him is affirmation. James Flaming was pastor of First Baptist Church in Richmond, Texas. He tells a story about when he was growing up that uh, he said the Flaming family reunion was the one time of year where all the Flamings would come together and they would work hard at not disappointing Grandmother Flaming. That the Flaming family was as close to aristocracy as you could get in Texas. And at the Flaming family reunion, Grandmother Flaming would break out the fine linen, the fine china, the fine crystal, and the fine silverware. The silverware that had more than one fork to eat with. And there was one thing that, that she didn't allow at her fine table, and that was children under the age of 12. That once they turned 12, that was when they could come to the, to the adult table. Well, he was looking forward to the day that he'd come to the, and sit at the adult table at the family reunion. He was looking forward to it until about two or three weeks before the family reunion. That's when his parents began to rehearse with him what he was to say and not to say, which fork he was to use, which spoon he was to use, how to use his napkin and where to place it in his lap or in his chair. And then he got so nervous, he wasn't looking forward to it at all. He was certain he was going to say or do the wrong thing and upset Grandmother Flaming, and nobody wanted to upset Grandmother Flaming. Well, time for the reunion came. He sat down at the table. The prayer was said, and he was just hungry. He reached for a roll, and in reaching for a roll, he accidentally hit his tea glass and dumped the tea and ice all over the table. The, ta the room went silent, and everybody looked to Grandmother Flaming to see what the, her reaction was going to be. And that's when Grandfather Flaming spoke up. Well, he never spoke up. And he said, this is just too great a burden for one 12-year-old boy to carry. And he tipped over his own tea. And then one by one, around the table, each person tipped over their tea glass. That's affirmation. <laughs> That's affirmation. It says you belong. It says you're one of us. That's affirmation. It says, I'm with you. You matter. This morning, do you know anyone who needs affirmation? Maybe a son or a daughter. Or maybe a husband or a wife. Or it may be a mother or a father. It may be someone that um, is at your school or at your workplace. Or someone that lives close by. Maybe someone in your neighborhood. Do you know someone who needs affirmation? God uses ordinary people in extraordinary ways. When they use affirmation, affirmation that says, you belong, I'm with you, you're one of us, you matter to God, so you matter to me. God does his most extraordinary work through ordinary people who give affirmation. God does his most extraordinary work through ordinary people who rely on him. And the last thing that I want to talk about this morning, God does his most extraordinary work through ordinary people who, well, they don't quit. For 20 years, Sisera had been rolling over Israel, so much so that they were afraid even to, to join together. To meet. The peasantry ceased. They went roundabout ways. They, they kind of hid from each other. Didn't, they didn't take main roads because people didn't know what would happen. But Deborah didn't quit. Deborah didn't quit. She kept doing what God had called her to do. 
an ordinary mother in Israel, did what God had called her to do. I read a story about Ignacio Paderewski. I didn't know anything about Ignacio Paderewski. He was a virtuoso pianist who was from Poland and he traveled all over the world giving concerts. Well, he became so popular all over the world and all over Poland that in the early 1900s, I think it was 1919, he was elected prime minister of Poland. Well, when he gave concerts, he didn't just go to the big cities where thousands would gather. He did that, but he also went to the small towns. He thought that everyone should be able to hear great music and be inspired by it. Well, this story takes place in one of those small towns. A mother brought her young son who's taking piano lessons to hear the great master, Paderewski. Well, as they were gathering, mother turned to speak to a neighbor, and when she turned back around, her son was gone. He had been taking piano lessons, and he was attracted to the piano on the stage. Well, he wasn't just on stage. He was crawling on the piano bench. Well, the stagehands were moving in to haul him off the stage, and that's when Paderewski himself stepped on stage and waved off the stagehands. He went up to the little boy, and he whispered in his ear, don't quit. Well, the little boy was plunking out, twinkle, twinkle, little star. And with his left hand, Paderewski reached around the little boy and began to compose a bass part that went along with twinkle, twinkle, little star. He whispered in the little boy's ear again, don't quit. And with his right hand, he began to play legato up and down the keyboard and began to compose a, a beautiful song around the little boy plunking out, twinkle, twinkle, little star. And when the people left that day, that's what they remembered. The arms of the master around a small boy, whispering, don't quit. Don't quit. This morning, it may be that you're in that place where you feel like, well, you feel like 900 iron chariots have just rolled right over you. Jesus died on the cross to forgive you and me, not just as a symbol of love, but to forgive you and me. And he rose from the dead, not just a symbol, as a symbol of his love, but he rose from the dead that he might live his life through you and through me. Ordinary people with his arms around us saying, don't quit. Don't quit. That it's, it's his power, his strength, the power and strength of the Holy Spirit that, that lives through, through you and me. And maybe that this morning you're at that place where you need to know you're not alone. Don't quit. God's not done with you yet. That God does His most extraordinary work through ordinary people. Well, like ordinary mothers fathers, like ordinary sons and daughters, ordinary people like you and me. Pray with me. Jesus, we always need your strength. And this day is no different at all. And I do believe that there's some folks that this morning they feel like they've been rolled over or maybe passed over, maybe forgotten. May they know the arms, your arms, the arms of the master around them. And, and this morning may they hear your voice and know the strength of your spirit that gives peace, that gives power to keep going. So don't quit. Lord, it may be that there's some folks this morning that, well, they're tired and they're worn out because they've been trying to not just do what you've called them to do, but try to do, be perfect and do what everybody else is not doing that they think they ought to be doing. And they've not relied on you to do your part at all. Lord, give us strength, the power of your Holy Spirit, to rely on you, to lean on you, 
and to trust in you. To trust in your strength and your forgiveness. Lord, I ask this day also that you give us that strength and that power that has eyes to see. Those who, who need that word of affirmation, that need to know that they matter to you, that they matter to us. And that you give us that strength to give those words of affirmation. It's in Christ's name we pray. Amen. Thanks again for joining us today. Um, just a reminder, if you'd like to watch the entire worship service, you can do so via live stream at 9 o'clock and 11.15 a.m. You can also view the service on demand a little bit later this afternoon at rumc.com slash sermons. Also, if you have any prayer requests, we would love to hear about those. You can send those in to pray at rumc.com. Also, if you'd like to give of your tithes and your offerings, you can do that online as well. And that's at rumc.com slash giving. Uh, thanks again for joining us today and for honoring God with your presence. We hope and pray that you have a wonderful week and we look forward to seeing you again next week. Hi, thank you for joining us. My name's Tom Davis. I'm senior pastor here at Roswell United Methodist Church. Our mission here at RUMC is to help people live a Christ-centered life. We're a welcoming church, we're a biblical church, and we're a compassionate church. That the, we believe that the way that, that God made us, that He made us in His image. And what the Bible tells us is that His image is an us, is an our. When God said in the creation story, let us create humans in our image, He made us to be in community together. He made us to connect to Him and one another. That's the place that this is at Roswell United Methodist Church, a place of community and faith. I want to invite you to join us. It might be online, it might be through social media, or it might be here in person. We meet at 9 o'clock in a contemporary service with a band. We also have two 1115 services. One is here in the sanctuary with a traditional choir, an organ. We also meet at 1115 with a band in our chapel. Thank you for joining us, and I look forward to meeting you.